All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to share my screen and that should be the key focus here. So thank you for joining us. My name is Melanie Schlotterbeck and I work with the nonprofit Friends of Harbors Beaches and Parks. And this is our first ever virtual hike. Our focus is Chino Hill State Park. We're gonna be walking the trail of Upper Aliso Canyon and it as well as 62% of Chino Hill State Park recently burned in October of 2020 in the Blue Ridge fire. So we're gonna be chatting about quite a few things related to the park, its wildlife and plants. And as things start to occur, you'll see a very changed landscape. So a couple of housekeeping items. This virtual hike is being recorded. We are gonna post it to YouTube. All the participants are gonna be muted. The chat feature uh, is available to ask questions. You should direct them to Amy Litton, who is joining me and co-hosting this workshop today because I can't see anything when I'm in presenter mode the way I have it set up. And I'm going to regularly pause to ask if you have any questions of me and then certainly I'll allow time at the end of the meeting to ask additional questions. And again, like I said, if you have to leave early, no big deal. We're gonna post this to our YouTube channel so you can watch the end of it if that's of interest to you. So some of our Zoom basics, uh, you can see I've moved some of the critters into positions where people would be. And these are some of the critters that you might see at Chino Hills State Park. You know that Let's get my annotation here. You know who's talking because their box is outlined in the yellow green. We also have this chat feature at the bottom and you should select Amy Litton, who's one of the co-hosts. You type your content here. And if this becomes too distracting for you, you can always close it by using the feature up at the top. Uh, we have everyone muted so that we can maintain a good recording and you can turn your video on, you can turn it off, it doesn't matter to us. We also have view options where you can pick speaker view or gallery view depending on what's most important to you. And then there are reactions down here at the bottom where you can give a thumbs up, et cetera. Again, based on the settings that we have on our end, I can't see any of those. so. Uh, I would encourage you to use the chat feature instead. So today, today's presentation basically gives you a quick overview of our nonprofit, Chino Hill State Park, some wildlife, plants, and cattle history information, fire ecology, so what wildfires have burned, fire frequency, how it relates to our plants that are in this particular geography, humans' influence on those fires, rain's influence, and then we're gonna give a quick tour of the Rolling M Ranch and then make sure that folks understand trail safety and trail identification in the state park, but it also applies elsewhere. So first up, who are we? Well, Friends of Harper's Beaches and Parks or FHBP as we lovingly like to call ourselves, our goal is basically to protect the natural lands, waterways and beaches of Orange County. We have a hiking subcommittee that has put on in-person hikes uh, when the pandemic did not exist. And now this hiking committee has decided to go virtual. So I'm on it. Mike Wellborn, our board president, Amy Litton, who's the co-host today, Mina Brown and Maureen Gates. So a couple of the key accomplishments for our organization, you'll see on the left, the green vision map, that is 20 years worth of information from conservation nonprofits throughout Orange County. It documents all the lands that have been protected and all the lands that are in need of being saved. Through that map, we built a coalition and we worked with the Orange County Transportation Agency to create a mitigation program that basically has protected 1,300 acres and restored 350 acres. And we still have about $150 million to spend of the original $243 million. And last but not least, and more the wonky policy side of things, I work a lot with local and regional 
planners, um, agency staff on policies and write toolkits and reports for both the public agencies, planners and staff so that they can understand the environment, conservation, sustainability and planning tools. So at this particular moment, I will launch our first poll and see if people have ever been to Chino Hill State Park and find out how you heard about this virtual hike. Couple more seconds. All right, let's check out those results. So in terms of folks that have been to Chino Hill State Park, it looks like most people have been there before and a couple folks know, um, know the Rangers and the Rangers know them by name. Hopefully that's uh, it's because you're on good terms, not because you've done something <laughs> inappropriate on the trails. Um, how did you hear about the hike? So it sounds like most people heard about it from the newsletter. That's great. Um, and a couple of folks from Facebook and Twitter. So I have done my best to make sure that this uh, entire presentation is as interactive as possible through opportunities to chat and ask questions as well as do polls because who likes to just sit and watch a presentation? I don't. So I'm trying to bring in my environmental education uh, background. So first question is, where is Chino Hill State Park? Well, this Google Earth map shows the state park boundary here in green, and it is in three county, but abuts a fourth. So Orange County, Riverside, and San Bernardino all have Chino Hill State Park in it, and then it abuts Los Angeles County. I do want to make sure that we honor the indigenous peoples that lived here prior to uh, our settlement. You can use native-land.ca to find out who lives in your particular geography. So the Kits, Tanva, and Luceno peoples were here and likely still are in many of our communities. So how do I get to Chino Hill State Park? Well, there are four key entrances. The first one in Brea has a parking lot at the Discovery Center. The Quarter Horse entrance in Yorba Linda also has a parking lot, a trailhead. The Santa Ana River, you can enter either through Corona or through Anaheim. And then Bain Canyon, which is the drive-in entrance. And that's the entrance that we're gonna end up using. So in terms of preparing for a hike, uh, I have used the REI essentials list. There are 10 essentials that are important to bring along on a hike. And I emptied my pack so that you could see exactly what I brought. We are part of and one of the founding members of the Safe Trails Coalition, which aims to find a balance between recreation and resource protection. So this is an opportunity for us to make sure everybody understands safety from the recreation side. You'll see I did not have anything related to fire, um, mo mostly because I, I know that this landscape is surrounded by a lot of people and easy access points from communities. So trying to get somebody's attention through fire wouldn't be as beneficial as a whistle. And instead of a shelter, because we don't have temperatures that are freezing, um, I bring cash instead. And of course, with the pandemic, I have a mask. So at this point, Amy, I'll find out if anyone has put anything into the chat has any questions on any well, it's kind of quiet out there so uh everybody start thinking of questions melanie is an absolute uh, uh she's got a lot of information that uh, she can and will share but more than we can fit in the time today unless you guys ask a specific question great all right well we'll just keep uh, moving forward then so in terms of using a map, you do wanna make sure that you're using the official map related to the location that you're going. So this is the Chino Hill State Park brochure. This is the official map of the state park. And 
you want to make sure that you understand anything you need to know about the trail before you go on it. Because uh, if you're not fit enough to be on it, if it's got boulders and you're bringing a stroller, that doesn't work. So I use the Google Earth tool to plot out our distance, which was 1.4 miles. Um, under the ruler feature and path, you can change this to miles and get the length. And then the trail type, we're doing an out and back. So we're on the same trail the entire time. And you can also select elevation profile to figure out the elevation gain or loss. So 136 feet is a very flat trail. What do I need to know when I get to Chino Hill State Park? Well, let's do another poll find out what you need to know. Specifically, I'm looking at wildlife encounters. You should understand what might be out there that you'll encounter and how to appropriately behave. about half, halfway there. All right, in the poll in three seconds, two, one. And let's look at our responses. So in terms of what do you do if you encounter a mountain lion? Well, according to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the agency that oversees the animals uh, and plants in our state, especially the ones that are threatened or endangered, you want to scream, look big, throw things, and stand your ground. If you are ever attacked, you do want to fight back. If you have small children, you want to make sure that they're in the center of the circle. Um, protect them. Do not run. Uh, that will initiate the predator response in their, uh, they'll be basically motivated to attack. And then what do you do if you see a snake? Well, <laughs> you may faint. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. You do want to stay alert, stay calm, and give it time to move off the trail. Uh, one of the things that I do is I point to it, which gives people a visual cue. And then I say three times for an audio cue cue, snake, 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 so that everybody is aware. Um, and yeah, if there's time and you feel safe, you could always pull out your photo or pull out your camera and snap photos. All right. And as we start to enter the park, you're going to see a lot of signs. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to when it's open, when it's closed, if the gates are open or closed. And you'll notice I've now started putting at the bottom of the photo, the date that I took it. I did this uh, hike three times to get three different versions uh, right after the fire, about a month later, and then two months later. You do want to make sure you pay your fee. You can pay it to Rick or you can pay at the self-registration kiosk, park in the 15-minute parking zone. It's five dollars and then you make sure you put that on your dashboard so that the rangers, when they're doing their patrols, know that you're, uh, you've paid your fee to get in, which helps support this park, um, whether it's restoration activities, um, fire recovery, staffing, et cetera. So we're driving in three miles on a paved road to Upper Aliso Canyon. And when you get there to the end of the road, you're going to see a big barn. This is the Rolling M Ranch. It was the headquarters, essentially, for cattle operations. And there's a parking area in front of you. It's a dirt lot. So we have found a place to park. We've confirmed on our map, our official map, which trail we're going to take. And before we hop on the trail, I'll pause again, Amy, and find out if anyone has posed any questions. Um, no questions posted that I'm seeing, uh, but I did have <clears throat> a couple of questions. Uh, one on entry, I, um, state parks do have a pass. Am I correct? That's also good at other locations? Correct. 
I do believe it depends on what type of pass you have. Uh, sometimes, well, most times it actually does not cover camping, but it should it come, that pass should come with a list of parks that allow that day use pass uh, without paying an additional fee. And we do now have a question um, mentioning something called birdability.org. And it says it's a resource for those with disabilities and a project to survey parks and birding trails to add information to the US map that's part of the site. So that, that sounds like something since you're there anyway, uh, sounds like a good opportunity. Absolutely, that's a great um, tidbit of information. And I'll make sure to look at it when we uh, conclude the presentation. All right, so we'll continue on. I have now moved our map because it's easier to, to relate to some of the photos into Google Earth. So here's where I parked the car. We're going uh, 0.7 miles up to Sidewinder Trail. So this red square is our destination and you can see some faint lines here. Those are Southern California Edison power lines. So that'll be a clue that we're getting close. Always confirm that you're in the right place. Aliso Canyon Trail, we're going to Sidewinder. Yep, you can see the burned vegetation in the background. And this looks like something out of a scary movie. Um, this pepper tree has clearly seen better days. The fire got a hold of it and burned most of the vegetation off, except at the very tippy top. Uh, there used to be a ranch house here. You can see the bricks and the fencing. And then this windmill and outhouse or shed, if you will, which pumped water from the creek uh, along here. So as we proceed forward, the first thing I noticed was this downed sycamore tree. There's a lot of sycamores in this area, which provides great habitat. And it could have been seen as a danger. And so it's important to make sure you're aware of potential hazards, including ones that are plants. So I'm gonna pause again and launch another poll focused on plant encounters. And we'll see how many of you know some dangers related to plants. All right, maybe 10 more seconds. All right, let's share these results. So the first question is what West Coast plant causes a skin rash? And the answer is poison oak. We do not have poison ivy here. Uh, and what do you have to touch to get the oil that causes the rash? And actually, it's any part of the plant. So if you aren't sure if that particular plant is poison oak, don't touch it. Um, and then the last question is, what is the saying to remember? Yes, leaves of three, leave it be. And if you uh, are a botanist uh, or a plant lover, you'll likely say, no, no, it's leaflets of three, leave it be. So, but the easy way to remember it is if you see what appear to be three leaves, don't touch it. And as I proceed on, I do take my nephew on quite a few adventures with me. So this is him and this is poison oak. And this photo was from 2016. Here's what poison oak looks like. And again, you can see the leaflets of three right here, but it does come in different colors and sometimes those leaves do drop off. So if you find uh, an empty stick, uh, just be cognizant of the fact that it may be poison oak. So this is that same general location. And again, you can see from 2015 and the berm here, there was a lot of poison oak in this particular geography. So we are slowly making our way through Upper Aliso and we're gonna pause right here at a restoration site. 
Back in 2015, the land was cleared. You do see some vegetation growing. In 2017, they were still getting the infrastructure in and doing the grow and kill cycle for the non-native plants. By 2018, the plantings had begun and then the fire came through in 2020. And I do find it kind of funny that there's a no smoking sign here. So these plants uh, have taken a hit and we're doing quite well. But after three rains, you can see some of them are already starting to sprout. Um, it's highly likely, although I did not go off trail to find out what these plants were, that the ones closest to the uh, sprinkler line are non-native species. In terms of water drainages, these are important locations that animals can traverse to get from one place to another because they tend to be pretty unimpeded. Um, but you can see a lot of leaf litter in there now. And sometimes there's water in this creek and sometimes not. But I do wanna pause and talk about two species. One of them is the least bells vireo. This is a bird that loves riparian areas and it's considered uh, endangered. And so its habitat and the number of birds left is lower and so uh, our wildlife agencies have basically created plans to help ensure their survival. And then the second species is the mountain lion. And while mountain lions are found up and down the state of California, the reality is the ones in Southern California are at risk of going extinct because islands of habitat are being created with developments going in and roadways going in. So this particular Southern California subspecies of the mountain lion is proposed for listing. Right now, our wildlife agencies are determining whether or not uh, that species is worthy of protection. Um, we do have both of these species in the state park, and this is just one area you may find them. So always being aware of what is going on around you is important. And I looked down and happened to see some scat and scat is poop. And so who was here before us? Well, apparently there was a bunny that was likely eaten by a coyote. Uh, there's a footprint here from some hiker. And then you can see a bike tread going through the dirt. So it's always important to be aware of your surroundings, especially post fire, because there could be hazards that may not otherwise be there. So I'm gonna pause and do another poll and we'll talk about what animals eat bunnies. All right, about 10 more seconds. All right, looks like we've got as many votes as we're gonna get. So what type of animal likely ate this? Well, I wasn't around when it happened, um, but based on what I know of coyotes, we can likely say it was an omnivore. It could have been a carnivore. And then how old is this scat? I always, uh, I'll say, play this game with my nephew. If it's very brown, then it's very new. Um, if it's got a little bit of gray in it, it's probably the last few days. And if it's really old, it's got a lot of gray. Similar to our hair when we're young, middle-aged and old. All right, we're almost to the point where we're uh, gonna see, so, oh, our, this is our first video, I take that back. So this is another area that has been cleared for restoration. So make sure your sound is up. I did, uh, this one might, might be a little windy though. Come on.
So you can see a lot of the sycamores in this particular uh, image were hit pretty hard in that riparian area, but you did get our first glimpse of power lines. So we're continuing to walk forward. That was this bare spot here. And we're now at the tree of bees. This is what my, my nephew called it because there used to be a beehive there. A lot of leaf litter from the fire. And we'll watch our first video and then a second one a couple months later. Oops, I did that last time as well. Let's try that again. So you can see not a lot of activity going on and a lot of uh, things that appear singed from the fire or outright burned. So this is a couple months later and I did turn the volume up all the way, but um, see if you can listen for something new. So you can see quite the difference. There's now some green vegetation and hopefully you were able to hear the birds who moved back into the area just a couple months after the fire. As I proceed forward on the hike, um, I did notice some sycamore trees that were burned out of the center here. Here's a close up version. Um, this becomes new nesting opportunities for cavity nesting birds. So something to keep in mind that just because it's burned, it still has a useful purpose in our ecosystems. And again, those power lines, we see them, but I've also now noticed there are these concrete structures. What could they be? So let's pause and do another poll. Tell me what you think this might be. All right, maybe five to seven more seconds. All right, let's see where we landed. So what do you think this structure might have been used for? Yes, we know that there were cattle in this area. So the correct answer is feed slash water opportunities for cattle. Um, there is a stream right next door, and so likely there's piping that came to this and it was used as a way to gather um, the animals together at that particular location. So now we're going to make it all the way to the end where Sidewinder Trail is and look at a couple videos. So how do we know we're at the right spot? Well, <laughs> there's our trail sign. And you can see Sidewinder Trail is a narrow trail. It's only a couple feet wide. It's called a single track trail. And the trail that we've been on is considered a road uh, in Chino Hill State Park. And those can be 10, 12, 14 feet um, wide. So we're at the point of doing a video at this particular location. I'm getting a notice that you're still seeing the share results. So I apparently didn't do that. There we go. All right. So let's look at a video here of Sidewinder and the juncture with Upper Aliso.
And now let's look at that two months later. So you can definitely see remnants of the fire, but you can also see that new life is coming into um, the state park because of a couple rains. So Amy, at this point, I'll pause again, right before we jump into the fire history for Chino Hill State Park and see if anyone has any questions. Uh, we do, we have a question from Cheryl asking if there are any cameras set up throughout the park to catch the wildlife in the area. You know, I don't know that there's cameras set up for wildlife in this area. I do believe there are cameras in other locations and there are trail counters as well. Uh, we have another question about the, the, the amount of weeds that grow back after a fire. Yes, that, why don't we hold on that one and we'll see, uh, <laughs> see if I answer it in the coming slides. All right. And if I don't, please repeat the question then. All right, so we'll move on and focus now on, on the burns that have happened in Chino Hill State Park. So again, the area outlined in green is Chino Hill State Park. One of the Green Vision Coalition members that um, we are close partners with is a group called Hills for Everyone. They created Chino Hill State Park and we are indebted to them for that effort. They have done two wildfire studies and have posted their data online so that the public can download it and use it in a program um, of Google Earth. And just by way of background, that, um, that information launched the curiosity of our organization to figure out the fire history for the Santa Ana Mountains and Laguna Coast. So essentially all of the territory in Orange County has been reviewed in terms of where fires are starting, uh, when, why, and how. So the first big fire in Chino Hill State Park was in 1943. You can see it outlined, the perimeter outlined in red there it was the Santa Ana Canyon fire. Fast forward to 1980, the Owl Fire occurred we're in this canyon right here. So, so far it hasn't burned in the big fires until you get to the freeway complex fire of 2008. And then 95% of the state park burned with just little tips in a couple places that did not burn. This was devastating for the park. This map is the fire frequency map for the state park, very similar to uh, population density, the darker the color, the more often it has burned. So you can tell this part of the state park has burned a lot, eight, more than eight times. Where we are is right here at two to three fires. And then we had another fire that burned. But before I talk about that one, I do wanna mention that our habitat types, coastal sage scrub and chaparral, naturally uh, anticipate burning every 30 to 150 years. It can take them that long to recover from a wildfire uh, because of the amount of energy they have to expend regrowing. So the next fire is the Blue Ridge fire in 2020. So this map overlays the freeway complex fire in purple, the Santa Ana Canyon uh, fire in blue, the Owl Fire in pink, and then the Blue Ridge Fire in orange. So you can see that it did burn the canyon that we're in right here. And the fire frequency, therefore, is a lot higher than it should be under normal conditions. And these are just the big fires, mind you. This, the maps that I'm showing you don't include all the little fires, except for the freeway, uh, or the fire frequency map that I showed you. 
So at this point, I think I'll pause again um, and ask the question uh, for the chat. So type your response there. What has surprised you most uh, on this virtual hike as we make our way back to the car? And then Amy, when you get a couple of those comments, feel free to read them. All right, well, we have a, a couple questions so far. Uh, uh, one is more of a statement that fire is so big, so frequent. Another kind of is questioning the number and frequency of fires. Another is apologizing for the frequency of the fires. Uh, so maybe you can talk, uh, speak to that, uh, speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so I'll mention that uh, going back to this map, this map includes data of 151 fires. And that means the territory in and around Chino Hill State Park is burning more than once every year, uh, generally every six to eight months. That doesn't mean the whole park is burning, but portions of it. And so when our plants are adapted to burn every 30 to 150 years, uh, that fire frequency means um, our native plants don't have a chance to recover appropriately and therefore non-native plants have an opportunity to outcompete them. Of the 151 fires, 40% of them started along the 91 freeway. And you can tell just based on this map that the 241 freeway has a lot of fires burning there as well. So what Hills for Everyone tried to do was identify problem areas and then work with state parks to address those. All but two of the fires were human caused. So we have drastically altered the natural fire regime of this geography. So when folks say we need to do fuel management, we need to do prescribed burns, the reality is we don't. We are already burning our landscapes way too frequently with human-caused fires that aren't planned. So good question. And yes, yeah, have, it is- one, one last question was, was uh, expressing some surprise at how much did not burn. Uh, do you agree with that? Um, I think it would depend on which fire. I think um, the winds from the Blue Ridge fire weren't nearly as devastating as the ones from the freeway complex fire and they shifted direction. So the only way to contain a fire that is burning uh, with Santa Ana wind conditions is to wait for the weather to change. You can't fight it on the ground. It's too dangerous. Aerial support is difficult um, because of the wind gusts and you've got things like power lines that are competing as well. So it, it wasn't as big as the freeway complex fire, but it was still big enough that only 12 years after the, the last big fire, 62% of the park burned again. And can you speak a little bit to the, uh, the amount of development that surrounds the park and how that affects the general topic? Yeah, so what we know from um, the hotspots here is that where there is access into the state park or roadways, that's where fires start. So this one is the prime example. It's an, a non-designated access into the state park that is um, basically illegally used by visitors to get into the park, but there was no buffer set up by the city of Yorba Linda when the project was approved for development that established a, a space between the edge of the backyard and the park. Instead, the backyard just meets the park and a lot of kids go up there and shoot off bottle rockets and fireworks. And so we know on the 4th of July, there will likely be a fire in this area. And so that is something we were able to determine. And I say we know that I also work with the group Hills for Everyone. So um, this inf information is near and dear to my heart and I know it quite well. And um, we were able to determine that on the 4th of July and the weeks leading up to it and after it, um, somebody should be stationed in that area or a fire watch volunteer to make sure 
uh, nobody goes up there with uh, inappropriate activities. So does that answer all the questions so far, Amy? Um, well, there's someone talking about uh, entering at RimQuest. Was that the unauthorized area? Yes, that is not a, a designated access into Chino Hill State Park, Quarter Horse, which is just a quarter mile west of that um, by way of driving, but really probably just a couple hundred yards um, west from Rimcrest. So that would be your recommendation would be to drive to the entrance area and there, therefore you'd be able to pay the fee? Uh, there is no fee set up there. Um, it's you're, you're allowed to go into the park on bike or foot or horse without paying. It's when you have a vehicle that you need to pay. Okay. But that is the, the recommended access. So we'll proceed on working our way back. So we can see a lot of the burned area. These particular riparian trees really took a hit. And we'll do a quick little video to show what it looked like a couple rains after. It also basically uncovered this great channel, water channel, that led to, I had never seen this before because vegetation had been growing um, too high up. The trail is up here, but there are culverts here for the water to escape to the other side and not ruin the trail. And here is a puddle of water in Aliso Creek. And this becomes a great resource for our wildlife that need and want and rely desperately on rains and other natural sources of water. Again, I spotted more um, trees that were being hollowed out by the fire. And I think it's also imp important to point out that dead trees and snags do have an important role in our ecosystem. And whether it's for cavity nesting birds or places for birds to perch, they're important. The only time state parks tends to remove them is when uh, they present a hazard to um, a trail or a building. So we're continuing to make our way down the trail. And this is interesting. So this is just basically after one rain, about a month, um, maybe six weeks after the fire. Didn't quite know how things were going to come back. This is after three rains. And you can see what I've circled here in yellow. These what look like dead branching plants um, that were burned in the fire are now starting to crown sprout from the base of the plant. And these plants apparently did have enough energy stored up in order to come back. I also noticed that after the first rain, we had grasses coming up alongside the trail. And this photo on the right has three different species of, uh, of non-native plants. So we've got the grasses, the thistle, and mustard. And mustard is rampant in the state park and it, it causes a lot of uh, perpetuating of the fire cycle. So in terms of native plants, it looks really pretty when it's green and when the mustard is in bloom with those bright yellow flowers. But what it turns into are these dry brush sticks, which means that after fires are non-native species, species that don't necessarily belong in this ecosystem, outcompete the natives uh, because they grow earlier in the season. They also dry out earlier in the season, ignite easier when it comes to fires, they spread fire faster, and therefore it increases the fire cycle. And all of that is bad news for a place like Chino Hills State Park. So restoration efforts are important. So we're back here to the tree of bees and on the on the way home, I basically looked for evidence. Um, these are teachable moments in environmental education. What did I find? Well, I found some things that belonged and some things that didn't. So remember to pack out your trash, leave no trace. We also found feathers. And while I am no biologist, um, 
something didn't make it. Uh, <laughs> likely um, uh, an animal like a coyote or a bobcat with the size of, of those bones. And then I also found a couple acorns and I love photographing acorns. So this one is intact. This one has a little hole drilled in it from an acorn weevil where the larvae end up eating the inside of the acorn and uh, it's basically goes bad. So that is, if, if you are one that collects acorns um, to make mush out of it, then this is not one that you would pick. Um, so I always find that interesting. So I'm continuing to proceed down the path. I remember that our poison oak is on the left. It's always important to be aware of your surroundings. So I keep my hands to myself and stick to the middle of the trail. And as I proceed down the path, I notice that our hillside stability is starting to change because of the fire. So the root systems may be intact, but maybe not because fire can go underground. Um, these plants help maintain the stability of the soil. And another issue are critters that end up creating holes in our hillside. So our slope stability uh, is compromised by both fires and uh, animals that dwell in the ground, as was seen recently in the mudslides in Silverado and Majeska Canyons, that after fires, that's something you need to pay attention to. I also found some coyote gourd. So this plant uh, normally is green and animals eat it, but uh, from what I understand, it's quite bitter. You may not wanna try it yourself, uh, but you can see some of them have been singed. The plant definitely uh, is low growing and on the ground, but at least at the moment provides some ground cover. So we're almost back to uh, the car and then I encountered some mountain bikers. And this is near the restoration site that we stopped at earlier. So we'll watch a video, uh, see if you have any questions and do a poll at the same time. So a lot of things going on here. So if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. And in the meantime, we'll do another poll about uh, trail etiquette. All right, just a couple more seconds on the poll. Someone uh, is saying that they can't submit their answers. Oh, okay. Well, um, unfortunately, I have no solution for that on my end. Um, they can type them into the chat if they want to participate that way. Hopefully, they can still read them. All right, we're gonna go ahead and end the poll. Look at the results. So as a recreational visitor to any parkland, you do wanna make sure you understand the rules of the trail. The trail etiquette triangle, uh, mountain bikers yield to, they're supposed to yield to everyone, both hikers and equestrians. Um, and I, I get it when people say no one because sometimes it feels that way. You, you'll notice that they did not announce themselves, but uh, at least one of them had some type of bell feature on their bike, which, which told me uh, in one way what, uh, that somebody was coming. 
uh, how fast are mountain bikers allowed to go? Uh, hopefully you cheated and saw in the video that it was 15 miles per hour. Sometimes it does feel like they can go as fast as they can, especially downhill, but making sure everyone has a safe experience is important. Uh, are e-bikes allowed in the state park? E-bikes are electric bikes. And the answer is no, they are not allowed in Chino Hills State Park. So again, it's as a park visitor, it is your responsibility to know what the rules are. So keep that in mind. All right, we'll continue on. Well, we did have a, a question there. Sure. Um, and in response to the not submitting our answers, the original person said, never mind. But someone else they couldn't said they couldn't submit either. And someone else suggested they scroll down. So okay. anyway, that's on that. But the question was about coyote gourd, whether yep. that was a native or non-native. It is a native plant. It does belong here. So I did want to chat for a moment, speaking of other native plants, on oak trees and the benefit they provide um, in a wildfire. There's three different versions of how oak trees were impacted. So this first tree appeared to take the brunt of the wildfire because a lot of the leaves are missing. The second one has some green, but also some tan or singed leaves. And the third one has a lot of green leaves. So this likely means that the fire came from the right side of the photo to the left side and the tree canopy of the oak tree uh, was able to absorb most of the embers in tree number one so that tree number two and tree number three were less impacted. So these are photos of the types of things that I saw then. So completely impacted, although some of them could also be on the ground, partially impacted and then intact. So we're back to our uh, location at the beginning of the trail. You can see the trail sign right there. We'll do another video of the windmill. I'm a huge windmill fan, so that, uh, always gets my, my blood flowing. So we've basically reached the car, but let's go do a quick stroll of the Rolling M Ranch. This is a maintenance area that park staff use. It's not a place you can go into, but I'm identifying the building for you. There are flush toilets here and behind uh, this um, toilet compound is the camping area with another set of toilets and showers. So it's a great place to camp. This, unfortunately, is the native plant trail, which was completely devastated in the, in the fire. Um, right now, signs are being recreated and plants will be restored to this area through the Chino Hill State Park Interpretive Association. Uh, they're kind of the fundraising arm for the state park. They applied for and got a grant from the California State Park Foundation to rebuild the native plant trail post fire. And because there's a lot of cattle history, uh, here's the barn, some cattle equipment, and then this really cool cattle chute where animals were loaded onto or off of trucks. Um, so I, Amy, am gonna ask a question and maybe when we get towards the end, uh, you can read them to me. So the question for folks to answer in the chat is what is something new that you have learned today? something new that you have learned today. And then when we get to the end of the presentation, you can read those while people come up with any additional questions. So this is uh, Aliso Canyon Overlook. It was the image I showed at the very beginning um, chart. It's amazing how a black ash laden landscape uh, is really hard to photograph, especially on a windy day. This is the before from right after the photo or right after the fire rather. And then this is the after from a couple months later and three rains, so big difference. And I do wanna just mention, cause I know it's an issue for Chino Hill State Park, uh, trail identification. So there are a couple types of trails that you're seeing here. There's one, and then there's some horizontal ones here as well. 
Let me launch my last poll and we'll see how you do at identifying trails. And if you aren't able to participate in the poll for some reason, go ahead and type your answer into the chat. We're at about 75%. So maybe 10 more seconds. All right, and we'll look at our results. So I have given some clues during my presentation. An authorized trail, that's one that you would find on the official park map, um, versus a social trail, which is something that people create on their own and it becomes a regularly used trail, but um, is not one that you should be on. Yes, there's a sign at the trailhead or trail juncture. Yes, it's on the official park map. Yes, it's either a single track, so three feet wide or up to 12 feet wide if it's a road. And so the answer is all of the above. All right, so we're on our way out of the park at this point. Actually, what I do want to say now that I'm um, remembering, these horizontal lines are former cattle uh, paths. So they may be mistaken for a trail. And then this one kind of meanders up the hill and it's at a really sharp um, point in the hill on the ridge. So you know that's not right. That's not normally how tra trails are built. There are certain grades that should be followed. So this is likely a wildlife trail. So it also doesn't have a sign next to the roadway. And again, always paying attention on the way out. It is a narrow bridge. Make sure you're uh, driving cautiously and slowly and sharing the road. And as a driver in the park on Bain Canyon Road, you do need to yield to uphill traffic. So make sure that you're providing enough space and opportunities um, are the pullouts for other people to pass. And as I wrap this up, there are six ways to get involved. So we will be emailing you our e-newsletter, thanking you for coming with a little survey about today's presentation. You do not have to stay on that list. We do not send out emails very often. We're not the type of group that sends them out five times a day. Um, you can attend more virtual hikes. We have one in two more months. Uh, Amy will be leading that and it's going to be at Upper Newport Bay. You can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter. You can support us through Amazon Smile where a portion of the proceeds from uh, your eligible purchases go to uh, support our organization or you can donate directly to us. So at that point, I am done with my presentation. It looks like one minute over. Happy to answer any additional questions. Uh, we, I will stay on as long as is needed. And if folks okay, well, have questions. We do have a couple questions. One uh, uh, before we come on to what people did learn from it, that there are not uh, cattle present in the park currently uh, was one of the questions. And uh, the other question related to how much wildlife is still present in the park following the fires. So in terms of cattle, there are no active cattle leases on the park. That does not mean that you won't see cattle because sometimes the grass is greener on the other side of the hill <laughs> so, or on the other side of the fence. And so if you do see cattle in the park, um, see if you can identify them by color. You know, is it white and brown? Is it black? Call state parks dispatch number and report them and then they call the owner based on the color and the markings and get somebody out to wrangle them. And then as it relates to wildlife, yes, um, there are definitely more wildlife now than there were right after the fire. The hope is that because this fire only burned 60, I say only burned 62% of the state park, that the animals had a chance to either go east towards Prado Basin. There are a lot of culverts under the 71 freeway so they could escape to the wetlands that way or go west towards Telegraph um, Canyon and Brea. So 
hopefully they had a chance to escape, but in the hikes that I've been doing in the park, the animals definitely are back in, um, in the park. So. Uh, what, one additional question. When you come into a park, do they have it posted when the most recent mountain lion sighting uh, has occurred? They have done that at the at the popular entrances, so the Discovery Center and Bain Canyon. Um, the most recent sighting, gosh, was probably 15 or 18 months ago in Lower Aliso Canyon, and both re uh, visitors saw it and the park ranger, and it was uh, a mom and a cub. And then as far as what people learned, uh, they spoke from everything to the role invasives play to uh, the, the general fire history and the role of volunteers. So um, some, some, good, uh, some good information there. Thank you. Excellent. So I'll pause again to see if there are any additional questions. If there are, happy to answer them. You can also reach out to me by email, uh, green as in the color vision as in sight. So greenvision at fhbp.org and I can answer them that way as well. So I'll, I'll pause for maybe another second or two and see what folks have or don't. And then we'll end the program. Uh, do you have a question about barbed wire? Mm. What's the, is there a specific question about it? It says, please talk about it. Oh, <laughs> so um, I'll start when I was 16 years old or so, I did a barbed wire removal on Northridge Trail because barbed wire impedes the movement of wildlife. And the barbed wire was used as a way to contain cattle on specific parcels. Well, the wildfire has functionally allowed for the mapping of and now removal because you can access um, parts of the park that haven't been accessible um, because of thick growing vegetation. So there's basically a team of about 30 people that are socially distancing as best as possible and have removed almost two miles of barbed wire. I think they've measured out about four and a half miles that need to be removed. And when things start heating up, uh, they'll they'll stop because of the risk of snakes and stuff. Uh, but but it's a great volunteer activity and really proud of those that have taken the bull by the horns, if you will, to to make sure that it's safe for the wildlife. And it's not just the strands that the issue is the issue. It's also the barbed wire that accumulates on the ground if a pole has been removed. Um, wildlife can get entangled in it and it's not safe. And this, a park should be safe for the wildlife that uh, reside there. Any additional questions, Amy? No, I think you've covered a lot of good ground. Great. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us. We appreciate it. And as soon as this is done downloading on my computer, I will start uploading it to YouTube and we will send out the link in case you missed any portion of it. I want to thank you again for your time. We appreciate your participation uh, and support of our organization. And we'll let you know about the next hike in two months, which Amy will be leading. Thank you, Melanie. Thanks. Take care, everyone.